Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's Spring Science Speaks seminar. My name is Heather Segali, Education and Outreach Director of the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center. To learn more about TURC, the research we conduct here and around the world, the public education and citizen science programs we provide, and our work with government agencies in the Tahoe Basin and beyond, please visit our website, tahoe.ucdavis.edu. You can also find out how to follow us on social media, how to participate in our activities, and help support our activities, including these monthly lectures. Uh, one of the goals of our seminars is to facilitate dialogue and discussion. We will be able to address questions at the conclusion of today's presentation via the Q&A function on Zoom, so at the bottom. Um, and that is better than using chat. Um, so if you can use that Q&A and type in any questions or comments, and then our presenters will get to those as many of those as possible. And before I introduce today's speakers, I wanna let you know of a couple other upcoming events. June 2nd, we're having a return to in-person with Nature Tells Its Story, the Climate Archive of Caves with Isabel Montañez. Um, June 15th through the 17th is our docent training. Starting the week, uh, or starting on June 20th for a week is the second annual Circumnavigate Lake Tahoe with Turk event and um, spots are limited. And then July 28th is the State of the Lake with Jeff Schlatto. So uh, we are going to be learning about the Living Snow Project and I will introduce or let uh, founder Dr. Robin Codner and collaborators, Dr. Allison Murray and Megan Collins um, introduce themselves and I will turn it over now. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead. Thank, thank you so much for having us. Um, maybe I'll start by introducing myself and then we can go to uh, Allison and then Megan and then we'll get started with our presentation. How about that? Okay. Um, I'm Robin Codner. I'm an associate professor at Western Washington University in the Environmental Sciences Department. and. Um, uh, when I started my faculty position at Western, I saw the potential to use citizen science, citizen scientists and citizen science as a um, method to generate large data sets to study snow algae blooms and track them over time. It's a really difficult thing to study and the Living Snow Project was born out of that idea and it's been really successful. And um, I'm excited to share that with you today. And so, um, Last year, I started collaborating with the with Allison and Megan at the Desert Research Institute, and I'll, I'll hand it over to Allison. Thank you. Um, I'm a research professor at DRI, and I study microbial ecology, and we often use the tools of DNA sequencing uh, and RNA sequencing to understand the diversity of life out in the environment. I work a lot in extreme environments. And one of those is studying life in ice and life in snow. And, and so we had a project in Nevada um, that was funded for about three or four years that started during our drought period, but we got really interested in life and snow and, and there, it talked about engaging citizen scientists locally in doing this. Um, and then uh, we have, kind of got connected through, uh, Megan wound up meeting Robin at a meeting uh, a couple, two years ago, I guess, and uh, really sort of set this in motion. Um, so we're really excited to be partnering with uh, Robin and, and do some neat science that we'll hopefully uh, get you excited about today. Hey everyone, um, I'm Megan Collins. I'm an education program manager at the Desert Research Institute. One of the areas of my work is communication and engagement strategies for a range of citizen science projects. And so when I met Robin at a, a virtual conference, it was really one of the, the most positive things that, that came out of the hours and hours of, of Zoom meetings that we were sitting on. So it's, it's um, a pleasure to be here presenting to you all. Um, it's a pleasure to bring the work that Desert Research does here in the Sierra and connect it with the folks at Western Washington, which is based up in Bellingham, if you hadn't heard of it, um, and and really um, expand, expand the great work that Robin has been doing. So let's jump into the science. Great, thank you. I hope this all works. All right, um, 
And Heather, are you all good? You can see my presentation. Yes, everything looks great. Thank you. Super. Okay. So the Living Snow Project, this is um, an image uh, from our website where you can go see what we're all about. And the Living Snow Project's goal is to engage the outdoor recreation community in research that's characterizing the biodiversity of pink snow and its impact on snowmelt dynamics. And so this is our general mission statement. We see the outdoor uh, recreation community. So people are already going out in the mountains as a, as a community of people that are highly invested in the environment. They're curious about the environment. They have the capacity to help us collect a data set that is bigger than any of any individual scientist or any collaboration of scientists could collect on our own. And um, again, we were started in Western Washington um, at Western Washington University and the focus of the Livingston Project really started with the Cascade Mountain Range, but has expanded out. And, um, and again, we have this focused effort in the Sierra, which has a really different kind of snowpack. And you'll hear about that, um, the comparisons from Allison in a bit. And so, and the different ways to, to engage. And we study pink snow. Um, sometimes the snow is red, sometimes it's orange, sometimes it's yellow. So we call it pink, but it's just colored snow. Sometimes it's called watermelon snow. The bright red or pink is the most obvious. And what is it? It is a group of microalgae that are growing in the snow. They're growing in a community that includes bacteria, includes fungi, includes other single cell heterotrophs that are eating algae or they're eating the bacteria that the algae are supporting with the photosynthesis that they're doing. So these algae are the primary producers of this system and can, um, can bloom or produce a lot of biomass at any given time in snow. They can also grow on ice, but in particular, we're talking about the algae that grow in snow and turn the snow bright pink. And this is a really obvious phenomenon for folks that have been in the mountains in the spring, and it occurs all over the world in alpine regions, as well as polar regions. And some of the species in alpine and polar regions are the same, and then alpine um, snow also has some um, species that are different than you find in polar regions. And they're of interest to people in terms of thinking about snowpack and the future of our snowpack, because the algae can change the way that the sun solar radiation reflects off the surface of the snow. So when you have white snow, it's considered high albedo where most of that snow is reflected off the white surface. If the snow is darkened, well, some of that solar radiation and a lot of it in some cases can be absorbed by the darkened color and that increases the rate of snow melt. You can think about, yeah, lots of people have experienced this when you're standing on a blacktop in the summer and you can just feel the solar radiation being absorbed and it's getting, it's hot, extra hot. That's what happens when the snow surface darkens. I'm gonna to try to keep track of the chat, right? But if folks have questions, they can put them in the chat. Okay. So this article is from the New Yorker um, in 2017, which feels old now, but this was the first big year that we ran the Living Snow Project. And this was sort of a alarmist title, but why the last snow on earth may be red. And this is discussing this relationship between how climate change may be increasing the habitability of snow by making snow and glaciers more wet, which is uh, what we think is uh, good for snow algae growth and that um, as snow, as, as the snow and glacier mass in alpine and polar regions around the world melts that we're gonna see more and more pink snow. Um, I think it's yet to be determined exactly how snow algae are going to be responding to climate change. But again, the kinds of data sets that we're generating through Living Snow Project are allowing us to, um, to, to study this process. So snow algae and alpine systems can appear in a lot of different um, a lot of different ways. A lot of times you get it when the snowpack is melting, and so you can have patchy snowpacks. Um, earlier in the season, it can appear as sun cups across large snow fields, and then as the season progresses, uh, this there's um, a concentration of the snow algae biomass after it starts to grow on the snow surface, and so you can see concentrations and layers in sun cups, as you see in this picture on the right. Um, but you can also see it kind of concentrating on the edges of melting snowpacks where some of these 
cysts that are produced by the algae can then um, rest in sort of the rest of the summer and overwinter as cysts on whatever substrate was left um, after the snow melted, after their habitat disappears. So alpine snow algae systems are, I think, particularly interesting because alpine systems are very dynamic both seasonally and annually. We were just discussing before the talk about the difference in the dynamics of the snowpack right now in the Sierras and in Washington. So we were anticipating an early spring and then we got five feet of snow in the region that I live in last week, which is kind of crazy. So it's still wintry here and we're, um, but the, you know, the weather and the um, annual variability and sort of when the snow is habitable, when it starts melting, determines when we find the snow algae. And then that dynamics across the season, it can be different, very different annually. And we expect to continue to be dynamic and change as climate changes. Um, not all the colored snow is the same species. And so there's a bunch of different species that turn snow pink and different species that turn snow orange. And so from the perspective of a microbial ecologist, this is very interesting because there's a complex ecosystem at play and dynamics and um, biogeography of these species. The snow algae also have complex life cycles. They're complex cells. Um, they are eukaryotes, which are like you and I. We are all eukaryotes with cells with nuclei. And they, um, the cells develop and have different life phases that change over time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that impacts the ways um, in which they can um, inhabit the snow and how the blooms come back seasonally. And there's strong connections between snow algae and the impacts on snowmelt, as we just um, discussed. And so the distribution of snow algae across mountain landscapes and between mountain ranges is not very well understood. And again, the data that we're collecting here, in particular, comparing differences between the Cascade Range and the Sierra is going to really help us understand these relationships. So just to give you a little bit of a picture of what this looks like, we think of this as an early season. So this is where we are right now in April. We're going to start to see snow algae develop. We'll see larger blooms and then the blooms will sort of become more concentrated and potentially more intense as the snowpack disappears throughout the growing season. And the growing season really ends when there's no more snow for the algae to grow in. And we can think about the snow taking on different characteristics. So early season is very wet snow. The snow becomes more consolidated um, and the snowpack becomes more consolidated mid to late growing season. And then it can even become somewhat dry um, and by the um, end of this snow algae growing season. And just to give you a little picture of what this looks like or how we think about this from an area that we've been working in in the Cascades, and this comes from Bagley Basin, which is right adjacent to the Mount Baker ski area for any of you who know where that is, um, holds the record snow, uh, uh, snow fall for North America. Um, so there's a lot, we get a lot of snow here in this region. Um, we looked at, this is the snow depth on the bottom across um, from January to the end of August. And you can see that the depth of our snowpack was different in each of these three years from 2017 to 2019. And then we mapped onto this how long the growing season, where, where the, when the growing season start, started and how long the growing season lasted. And we broke the growing season up into um, early, mid and late season by these different um, types of snow and the length of each of these um, periods were different in each of these years. So we know that the uh, habitat that the snow algae lives in is different annually. And again, to focus on um, some uh, of the sites that we work in here in Washington, this is just an example of three different places. This is where they're located um, in the North Cascades that host different blooms of different species. So this species um, is Clinomonas. This species is actually um, a not care, un uncharacterized snow algae species. And then we have uh, Sanguina. And each of these three sites hosts a different dominant snow algae. And so we think about these different snow algae they, um, they're different species and they also can have variations in this complex life cycle. So all of the species have a complex life cycle, but there's again variations within them and we think that plays a role in how they're distributed in different snow habitats. And the, there is a swimming version of this cell, of these cells for most of these algae, 
that then can produce a non-motile vegetative cyst. So oftentimes the swimming cell can be green, although it could, uh, so oftentimes it's green. These red cells also have green pigments. So they also have chlorophyll, but you can't see it because it's the cell is instead dominated by an accessory pigment called acid xanthin, which is again, why the snow turns pink. And there's a non-motile phase and then there's a cyst phase. And so the algae is, is um, developing from these different, um, these different life stages. You can think about this as a baby, this is kind of a mid-adult, and this is an old cell. And it is possible that these swimmer cells can be gametes and they can fuse to actually uh, allow the algae to have a sexual reproductive phase. So algae have sex. And that we think that some of these cyst cells are the products of sexual reproduction. That's right on the cutting edge of what we're doing in the more technical science part of the research that we do in my lab to understand the population genetics of these algae. And when we think about that complex life cycle over the snowpack over seasons, we've got this alternation between the small swimming cell and the um, cyst stages that we find on the snowpack. And we see them turning the snow pink in the summer. And then over fall and winter, they remain dormant as cysts in wherever they landed. And their snowpack fills in on top of them over the winter. And then in the spring and summer, when this snowpack is completely saturated with water, the hypothesis is, and again, this is a hypothesis. Nobody's been actually able to track all of these parts of the life cycle in the field for the different species of algae. Um, but the, uh, these can turn into swimming cells, we think swim up the snowpack, potentially reproduce there at the, at the, on the surface of the snow and then develop their pink pigment to make the snow algae bloom that we're familiar with. So in this hypothesis, then the algae that bloomed the year before are responsible for seeding the bloom the next year. We also know that algae can may be spread by wind dispersal and a lot of snow and ice microbes are dispersed via wind and so there also might be the impact of some of these spores becoming airborne and moving around to be found um, and to and to land back on the snow surfaces so it's probably a combination of both um, seeding from last year's bloom as well as spores blowing around to um, to produce a bloom a new bloom each year. So some of our major scientific questions are how diverse are these algae? How many species are there? How many species do we find living together within a community? My apologies for the dogs. How are these species distributed across mountains? Do you find the same algae in the same places each year? That's a great question that we're, we're starting to be able to answer using Living Snow Project data. Um, and a lot of times the answer is yes, but in some cases it's no. And so it's still a really complex question as to how the blooms perpetuate from year to year. And then are the blooms changing with climate change driven environmental changes? And so do we see blooms at higher elevations later in the um, higher elevations as we see um, uh, less low elevation snow, for example, or earlier in the season snow melt? And I think the changes, the answers to these questions are yes, but we're still developing data sets that allow us to answer this. All right. So how do we get the data that we work with at the Livingston Project? So we, here's a set of photos from students at Western Washington University um, processing these samples. So here's a whole bunch of Livingston Project samples. And what we do is we, we process the DNA that we collect from these samples, and we use that to fingerprint our, um, our snow. And so the DNA fingerprint of a snow microbiome comes from when you collect all the cells that are in pink snow, you've got a mixed populations of cells. So this includes the bacteria and the fungi and the other single cell um, heterotrophs that live with the algae. And we extract all of that DNA and we sequence it. And each of these species has a unique DNA sequence. Um, I could put them species in quotes because sometimes we don't call microbes we don't give them species names, but we, they're essentially species. And each of these has a unique, um, unique sequence. So then when we get these mixed communities of, um, of DNA, we can then identify which of the species are present in the sample. And when you do this, each of, when we do our sequencing runs, we can get, you know, roughly 
we target about 10,000 sequences per sample, but we can get up to 50 to 100,000 sequences per sample. And if we have hundreds of samples that we're working with, you can imagine that that's a complicated data problem to say, how do you deal? How do we deal with that? How do we look at the data? So one way we look at the data is we do clustering. We, once we've identified which species enter which sample, we give each piece of DNA a name, a species name, and then we look to see which species are distributed in each sample and we can cluster them. And so these are samples that came from 2017 from the Cascades. And we determined that there were five unique clusters represented by these different symbols. And they, so there was five um, essentially use, unique assemblages of snow algae. And when we looked at those assemblages by their shape, we can look at the then uh, composition, species composition of each of these clusters. And so um, what we found is that each of our major species of snow algae in the Cascades were dominating different one, different of these, uh, different numbers of these assemblages. And some of the assemblages like our square assemblages were really mixed between many different, different um, algae species. And what's cool about looking at these samples in terms of an assemblage, again, these are our three dominant snow algae species um, dominating these different um, these different clusters or there's different assemblages. What's neat about this, when we look at them on this graph, which looks at elevation on the y-axis and Julian day of collection. So this is just each day of the year gets one number. And so January one is number one and December 31st is number 365. And so this is Julian day of collection. We can see that as we collect, as we move through the season, the mean elevation of our samples increases, which is what you would expect more high elevation snow and more high elevation snow algae as the season goes on. And that each of these groups is dominated by a different algae species. So the algae species essentially have a different preferred snow habitat. And, um, and we can see that in the data. So, so far, and we've been working on this uh, logging and getting uh, revamping our maps for all of the living snow sample uh, sample living snow project samples, excuse me, and we have 698 samples logged so far from 2013 to 2021, which is really exciting. This is a huge data set. And uh, you can see we've got uh, one of our volunteers lives in Barrow, Alaska. He's very excited and collects samples for us every year. So we have this really far north sample. We'd like to start recruiting more people in Alaska. Again, last year, our target was let's get folks in California and let's get the Sierra folks involved. And so the Sierra samples are shown here. This we blew up um, the West Coast here um, in purple. Although we do have some volunteers in BC that collect uh, in Canada for us. And we, so we have had samples collected in um, all of the states in the mountainous west so far. All right, and with that, I'm gonna, tra I'm gonna hand it off to Allison, who's gonna talk a little bit more about um, the comparison between the Sierras and, um, and the Cascades and the types of work that, um, that we can start doing more in the future. I just wanna note that um, last year, these were the samples collected by Sierra volunteers. It's an excellent distribution across the Sierra range. And so just by saying, hey folks, go out and collect wherever you're already going, it's really working out in terms of getting good coverage across mountain ranges. So nice job, Sierra folks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Robin. Um, yeah, we we had we just did this started last year with this sort of small pilot effort. And um we're we're really excited to see sort of the, the distribution. Um, I will put this map on here, um, which is a state National Parks uh, map, but really shows how the Cascades are linked to the Sierras. The Cascade, the southern boundary of the Cascade mountain range is uh, Lassen Peak. And, um, and then the southern uh, boundary of the uh, Sierra Nevada is Tehachapi Pass. So these, these two mountain ranges um, really kind of in the cover coverage runs right into each other. Um, so uh, we're really excited to really learn about the teleconnections between uh, the snow microbiome across um, this latitudinal gradient 
um, where the snowpack really changes. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And one of the things, I guess the last point on there was that the, the Sierra Nevada actually goes under the plate um, at approximately where Lassen is. And, and so this really defines the difference in these two mountain ranges. So I just came, we came up with a few comparisons between the Cascades and the Sierras. Um, the Cascade Mountains are really dominated by many active and dormant volcanoes. Um, that are uh, super dominant and that have, uh, you know, extremely high elevation compared to the, uh, the, the, uh, the base elevation. Whereas in the Sierra, um, we has a past volcanic history a long time ago in geological history. And so now granite really dominates um, up, up and down the, the Sierra Nevada. In the Cascades, there are many large glaciers um, and areas where seasonal snowpack last through the entire season. Uh, in the Sierra Nevada, we have um, small alpine glaciers. Most of them are over 10,000 feet. And these have been diminishing in size. Um, and some of them have disappeared you know, in the last 10 years. Um, the seep snowpack season, and we just saw in, in Robin's uh, chart there, goes well into September um, up in the Cascades. Uh, in some of these places where we're on seasonal um, or on, on glaciers. Um, in the Sierra, we have really high interannual variability. So everybody, if you're from the Sierra or Tahoe region, you know. Um, we have shallower overall depth, and I just have kind of two different uh, screenshots of the Sierra in 2015 and 2019, sort of showing a, a really big drought year in 2015 and 2019 was a very heavy winter. So we can, um, the, the range and, and certainly um, the amount of water that uh, our communities in California and Nevada get from the snowpack um, also varies significantly. Uh, in the Cascades, the snow algae blooms are large and they last late and long into the season. Um, whereas in the Sierra Nevada, we have shorter duration blooms um, given the season. And so the blooms, I would call them very uh, ephemeral and, uh, and they're quite patchy in their distribution. And I think one of the things that um, this project does is really help us be much more quantitative in the way that we are looking at snowpack and how algae forms and what the ecology is. Uh, next slide. Um, oops, one back. We have um, a couple of questions when we're then thinking of comparing these uh, and comparing these really in an actively changing climate. Um, how do the diversity of snow algae and the microbial community compare between these two different mountain ranges? Uh, can we identify transport of populations along the range? This will be something really interesting, Robin, when we can actually get to analyzing 700 samples now, and we're hoping this year we'll bring in another 100 to 200 more probably between us. Um, and how do the spatial and temporal extent of snow algae compare on a landscape mountain range scale? And so through the help of citizen scientists and also some collaborators that we have um, who are doing remote sensing, we're hoping really to sort of take what we're doing in the field and then being able to connect that to what we can do with remote observations. Uh, and then the third question here is, what are the implications of changing climate in alpine environments overall and, and the role of snow algae on albedo and the timing of snow melt? As Robin explained earlier, snow algae can actually have a positive impact on um, snow algae are dark and they change the albedo of snow and they can actually uh, increase the melting rates. So sometimes you'll see them in these runnels on hills and they can actually create the runnels where they start off in different sun cups um, and they, they can enhance the melting and, and really uh, create and enhance the, the rate of melting. Uh, next slide. So I have just a couple of pictures. We've worked down um, on Mount Kness, uh, which has had a longstanding glacier that has been melting uh, in the last 20 years. Here we did longitudinal transects uh, across, the, um, across the snowpack. Um, this was on a NASA uh, astrobiology 
of Icy Worlds project that we had a few years ago. Uh, the next slide. Um, we worked in the um, doing a, a time series study. So something that both Robin and I have been really interested in is really how does that snow microbiome evolve over the snowpack season? Um, and so we did this uh, work up on the Mount Anderson Ridge, kind of um, up on the ridge behind where Sugar Bowl Ski Resort is. And we dug these snow pits uh, on, I guess, six different occasions. And um, we then, uh, I had a student intern in my lab for the summer, and we just enumerated the differences of the bacteria, the algae, and the single other single-celled um, protists, which eat the bacteria and the algae um, over uh, this depth gradient in the snow, and then, and then uh, between February uh, till June when the snowpack was very thin. Um, so we can see that algae um, and bacteria, both their abundance uh, develops through the season as, um, as, as the time proceeds. But the protists are there and the protists are keeping things in check to some degree. Um, and then also we can see that if we just measure chlorophyll in the snow, so the lower right panel, um, sort of mimics a little bit of what we see with the algae. So the, the algae are that chlorophyll signal there. Uh, next slide. Uh, as Robin said, I just wanted to point out that, that in the Sierra, we can find all co different colors of snow algae. So um, the, as she said, the different species have different pigments. Also, when you're in different amounts of sunlight, you can find algae that um, are more protected or less protected. So in shadier areas, you can find some of these uh, like orange, brown, and green um, layers in the snow. And so the uh, one on the right there was um, collected up on Mount Rose. Uh, next slide. Okay, back to you, Robin. Thanks, Allison. So we wanted to do, uh, in this talk, we wanted to give you a, a sense of how folks volunteer for the Living Snow Project and how they collect data and, um, and, and how we use that data. So as a volunteer scientist for the Living Snow Project, folks can make observations and they can collect samples. And it's important to have an idea about how to recognize a good spot to make an observation and collect samples. That may be the number one question we get from people. How many samples should I take in a place and how do I pick a good place to take a sample? And there are um, some steps that we use that we use as scientists that um, we go through and that we suggest that the volunteer scientists also do. So the first thing you can do is survey the scene. So look around where you are, where is it pink? Where is it not pink? How big is the pink? How big is the snow? So this is a, this picture, um, oh, it's a video. I can show you here, surveying the scene. So we're looking, we've got a lot of melt. Um, I can see some areas of pink and this is a lake here. And kind of looking around, what do I have? Okay, so there's a lake, there's not lake and there's some pink off the lake and there's some pink on the lake. So that's kind of place where I might take two samples, one from the pink on the lake, and one from the pink off the lake. Ooh, there we go. Um, here's, a, I'm just gonna go through a couple of pictures of the ways that the snow algae presents. You've already seen a few from Allison. Here's a few others. So this is um, sort of mid-stage bloom in sun cups where there's some layers. And so you can kind of target where the algae is pinkest. And then if you look across these different sun cups, I tend to target the ones that are the biggest and brightest. That means that when you collect a sample, you're going to be getting as much biomass as possible, which means we get a lot of DNA. And the more DNA, the easier it, is, easier it is for us to work with the sample. And for the Living Snow Project, what we're really doing is at a course level, we're looking to see what species are present in that region, not necessarily differences between this sun cup and that sun cup. So the brightest one is a, is a good representative sample. Sometimes the pink is just across the whole snow pack on the surface of the snow. So this is before this snow algae has really created runnels or sun cups. And um, so anywhere from across the surface that hasn't been um, walked on by a person or a dog, um, or maybe doesn't have a lot of debris. So you wanna collect from the most undisturbed spots from places like this. 
Um, this is the Sisters Glacier, which is right in our backyard um, between um, Bellingham and Mount Baker. And you can see that there's just like a very, you may or may not be able to tell, there's a very light pink color on this glacier. And that is in fact snow algae, but the bloom isn't intense as somewhere else. And so even if you see just a light colored pink in a place that's interesting, that's still a good place to take a sample. Um, Goody Mountain is in the middle of North, Cades, North Cascades National Park. And this is just an example of how this is on the southwest side and the northeast side of the mountain. And the snow algae presented really differently on each side of this mountain. This was a trip in which we did. We went up and over the mountain. And so I collected a sample on each side. And I just, again, would pick and target a bright area like here and a bright area like here to take a representative sample of that snowpack. So um, you don't have many glaciers in the Sierra, but we can collect on glaciers. This picture with my dog is from um, Mount Shasta, which the north side um, has sort of like snow algae blooms all late in the season, like across the whole glacier. We can also collect an annual snowpack. So here's um, pictures of folks who are backcountry skiing, collecting samples. And you can see that there's sort of some pink starting in this light fluffy snow. And again, anywhere you would see it in sort of this annual snowpack would be a good place. So here's just a set of different pictures. Sometimes it has a lot of debris on it, which is okay. If the debris gets in there, it gets in there. Um, but sometimes you can get a really nice clean um, pink sample. Yet another example of um, the same, different elevations in the same region. Um, the lower elevation, the runnels were much more intense as, um, in British Columbia, but this snow algae is really, really bright where we went higher on the mountain. And uh, it was a little less intense for the bloom. And it was really an interesting collection of samples for us to get one of these really bright low elevation samples. And then, you know, later on your trip, as you move up the mountain, um, collect the higher elevation sample. So on this one day, we collected three samples and each one of them were different. And so if you happen to be going on a trip where you wanted to collect um, multiple samples from the same site at different elevations, that's an excellent set of samples for us. And um, I am gonna hand it off to Megan to talk a bit more about um, how to sign up to volunteer. Thanks Robin. Now that you all are experts in identifying snow algae um, in the field, I'm going to tell you how to get started. If there's one thing that you take away from today's session, it's that adventure-based community science couldn't happen without adventure-based community scientists. Each of those 698 samples that Robin um, shared on the map earlier was the result of the hard work, the sweat, the grit of a volunteer. And um, this fascinating work couldn't happen without it. And so we wanted to make sure that we had space to help you get involved if you are, um, if you do find yourself hiking up mountains on skis or um, up really high in alpine areas on foot. So the first thing to do to get started is sign up via link. I've just put our, our short link here in the chat. We also have a, a full Google Forms link. And the sign up form will allow you to, to select a bunch of options that work for you. Um, and the first thing to decide is if you either want to just make observations using the app. So this is visual or photo observations through the Living Snow app. Or if you want to make observations using that same app, as well as collect samples. And so all of the people that you saw in the photos who are holding those little tubes were doing sample collection. And we'll share details on that in a second. So that is the first big decision. The step, next step after you um, sign up is to get the app. And I'm gonna show you how to do that in just a second, but that is a crucial part of, um, that is a crucial part of participating in Living Snow. Step three, if you did opt in to sample collection, you'll wanna grab your kit. 
In our region, there are three pickup locations, one, at Re one in Reno at the Patagonia store, the second in Tahoe City at Alpenglow, and the third in Truckee at Tahoe Mountain Sports. So if you do select one of those pickup locations, you can just walk right in um, after you receive our, our email with directions and talk to the front desk um, for your kit. If you are farther away, let's say that you're in Mammoth or you're in Quincy and it's not an easy drive to make it to Tahoe City or Truckee, you can request to have one of the kits mailed and we will send it off. Our wonderful intern, Sonia, um, is in charge of that this season. And um, if you sign up via the form, you will also get email with step-by-step -step directions from her. And the last step, of course, is to hunt for pink snow. And that's what all those great tips that Robin shared just now will help you do. Um, and as you do that, you'll wanna make sure that you take both the sample and capture photos and submit them both. So let's talk about now, next slide, talk about how to access the app. So wherever you get your apps, you can simply search the Living Snow Project. It's available on both iOS and Android, and it's a free download. And once you sign up, next slide, you will see a pretty basic a simple home screen, very straightforward to participate in. We've got on the right, a little screenshot, and then Robin's gonna demonstrate what it looks like to actually submit a sample here when she presses play. Not sure if there's sound, but what she's doing is she's filling out if she's taking a sample or recording a sighting. I can make the sign work. I can make the uh, sound work. My, I was muted. Just give me a second. Okay. There we go. The first field says I'm taking a sample. If you click it, you can, Say I'm reporting a sighting, done. It automatically logs the coordinates. So all you need to do is upload if you want to, but you could also add photos and you need to take the photos ahead of time. So I'm gonna take a photo of this pink spot here. Go back to the app. I'm gonna select a photo in my photo library, finish. And then the photo's in there. And then you just press the little cloud button in the upper right and it will upload. And it'll say upload successful when it's uploaded. I have limited cell reception right now. And so it might hold on to the observation and upload it when I um, open the app back up again in when I get to cell service. Gonna make an observation. So there we go. Right. So before you heard some pro tips on identifying snow algae, now let's hear some pro tips on getting those photos that are so important for this science. Um, if you've ever taken a selfie before, you know that scale matters and your lighting matters. The same thing goes for snow algae. You can see in this example, we've got a snow field with a couple of items in the, the image so that our scientists can get a sense of scale. So there's this ice pick. If you don't have an ice pick using your shoe, a glove or one of those sampling tubes will do just as well. Taking multiple photos will help get a sense of the size of the bloom. So in addition to the, you know, the sample that is collected or just the observation, it's really nice to, to know if this is just a small patch or if it's a, a very big patch. And so scale matters and color matters. Next slide. And here are some great examples of things included in the photo for sale for scale. One is a person, another is a notebook. Um, getting a couple of photos like a close up and um, a landscape are, are really, really helpful um, for this. You'll notice that the, the woman on the left is wearing sunglasses. Um, I was excited to learn last year that polarized sunglasses actually help some of the colors pop. So if you are out, um, trekking around and you're wearing polarized sunglasses. And I, I reported back to the team, I was saying, I thought I saw snow algae, but then when I took off my glasses, I didn't see color, what should I do? <laughs> and um, so polarizing, polarized sunglasses can actually be a great help to you. I love that because I've been in the field with other snow algae scientists and we'll be like, you'll have like three scientists sitting next to you like glasses on, is it pink? Is that not pink? Is it pink? Is it not pink? So. It's pretty normal to have that question. Yeah, and we the advice that we give to um, new volunteers is that if you suspect you see some color on the snow and um, you haven't seen any else all trip, like there's not a, a definite 
concentrated patch, collect it um, because that 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 sample will help us if there is um, you know if there is algae in the snow. You know what? One of the things that I uh, I often do too is is dig a bit of a pit because if if you see something on the surface, often the snow algae will be connected. It, you'll you will you will see that pigment even if it's really light going down in the snow. So because it's coming up through the snow. So digging a pit to me sometimes helps uh, confirm that that I'm actually seeing what I think I'm seeing. Super, that's super advice. So let's say that you selected um, to sample as well as make visual observations or photo observations. This is what a sampling kit looks like. So you see that there are a couple of falcon tubes or plastic tubes that are labeled. Um, take note of those tube numbers because the, the app will ask you to plug them in. There's also gloves and then some directions. Um, and Jack is smiling here because he's so happy when volunteers return the samples. Um, You'll see that in the photo above Jack smiling, there's um, there's pink snow that's been melted, as well as liquid, which is a preservative that helps get um, that sample safely to the lab so it can be analyzed. So you might notice a little bit of smell when you open that tube. Um, that's why we provide gloves. It's not unsafe, but we do like people to protect their hands. Next slide. So here are some um, demonstrations of people collecting samples. So the, the, um, the video on the left shows a woman wearing the gloves and she's using the cap of that sampling tube as a little scoop. And you can see that she's dug down a little, just like Allison suggested, she's dug down a little below the surface because that's likely where it was highest concentrated and she's putting it in. And then in that center video, we've got somebody who's giving it a good shake. Once that um, once that sample has been collected, give it a good shake so that preservative gets distributed throughout the sample and again it can be protected. And, um, and, and Robin might have some other things to share about the, the different types of snow that um, we're seeing here. Yeah, there's just these are three different kinds of snow and it, this is fluffier snow on the right hand picture and you can see that it's, um, it's sometimes easier to get the snow into the tube. The next video we have shows some hard snow. I think it's, um, I'm gonna let, it's got a narration, so I'll let it go. Look how bright this is underneath. This is harder snow, later season. So you scoop it away and you find the brightest pink parts. Scoop them to the tube. And then to be able to fit more in, and shake it. So the, uh, that tapping on the shoe is very technical part of the sampling. <laughs> And then there's a bit more space and you just put more in. Yeah, pro tip, tap it on your shoe. You can tell this is later in the season because I'm wearing running shoes. So I was on a hike rather than a ski. Nice, yeah. And I see someone commented that um, they, they've seen pink snow before um, when backpacking in August. Yeah, the, that's great. You may be on skis, you may be hiking the, the snit, the, um, sample collection kits are lightweight, um, so I'll just pop them in my day pack when I'm going out, and it's easy to carry and have on hand if I opportunistically um, stumble across one. So we like people to pick them up early in the season, so go out, sign up now, pick them up early in the season, then have them on hand um, for whatever month it is that you, you might encounter the algae. Yep, and someone asked in the chat, what is the, or in the Q&A, what is the preservative used in the tubes? It's, um, it's called RNA later, even though we're using it to preserve DNA and it's a, it's ammonium sulfate. It's basically like a concentrated solution of Epsom salts. So it's not toxic, it's just really salty. Here's a quick recap of all of the steps, choosing your pink patch, opening the tube, scooping it to fill it with pink snow, giving it a shake, sealing up that tube. The sampling kit will have either um, electrical tape or parafilm to seal it up, give it a real tight squeeze. And then don't forget to record. Um, and finally, refrigerate it before you are able to drop it off. So keep that sample safe by popping it in the refrigerator before you either drop it off at one of the same locations where you picked it up or mail it to the address that is inside of your sampling kit.
Yeah, and there is another question in the chat um, that I see Allison is answering, but as far as the re refrigeration goes, like if you're on a week long backpacking trip, the preservative is supposed to be okay for the sample for up to two, I don't know where I got this stat, Allison and I have talked about this, for one to two weeks at ambient temperature. You obviously do not wanna keep the sample in the direct sunlight, so it's nice to keep it cool if you can, um, but you want to then put it in the refrigerator as soon as you get home, and then it can stay refrigerated for um, a fair bit of time before we receive it back. So um, it's fairly, DNA is pretty robust, and so it's fairly stable, but you do wanna keep it as cool as possible. Finally, you can not only share those pictures via the app, but also Instagram. You can use hashtag living snow or the little emojis, the watermelon plus the snow. We love seeing what people are up to. Um, and yeah, I'll yeah and we, we will share your photo. Um, this is this is a fun thing to do. Um, so we're gonna have a, there's another question, there's other questions in the Q&A and we can get to questions in a second, but I'm gonna sort of end with, we're gonna end with um, acknowledgements. There have been so many wonderful people who have helped make this um, program run. Besides myself and Allison as lead scientists, we also collaborate with um, Melissa Rice and um, Alia Khan at Western Washington University. And there's a whole suite of folks that have helped make this happen, um, including interns. I wanna put a shout out to Chris Chapin, who is the app developer. Chris has done an amazing job at pulling this app together. Chris was one of our volunteers who got in touch with me a few years ago and said, you know, what would make this better if you had an app? And so thanks to Chris for that. And then a number of students have made the from interns make this possible on um, Western's side. So here is all of those folks that I'm not gonna go through their names one by one, but um, we're grateful for all their help. That was great. I am wondering if you wouldn't mind answering some of the questions that you answered in the Q&A directly, just because I think people might be interested in the actual answered ones. So there was a question about ice worms that I thought was really interesting from Earl Byron. So the question was, do ice worms affect the algae populations? So maybe yeah, you could just- Yeah, and I don't think there's ice worms in uh, the tiny California glaciers, are there? I think they're only in the Pacific Northwest and in Alaska. Um, but ice worms are these worms that live um, only in glacier ice and snow. And we know that snow algae eat we know that ice worms can eat snow algae, um, but the exact sort of ecological relationships between the two is, has not really been studied in any kind of detail. So um, one thing I said is that we have a site where we sample regularly where there are ice worms and we collect them by accident all the time. And so it's sort of a place where we could do a, a deeper study, but um, that is an active area of research. We, we don't know that much. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I thought another great question was by Bob Coates about culturing the algae in the lab with artificial snow and bright light. Um, so yeah, I know, you, and, I know you typed an answer, but I just thought- Yeah, and I'd be happy. Yeah, so we have tried, and Alice can you pop into, because she may have also tried. There's a lot of, we, there are a number of snow algae that are in culture, but it's difficult to maintain them in culture red form. So oftentimes when we get them in culture, they'll grow as the swimming green cells. So they're not in the stage that we typically collect on the snow surface. And some of the one, uh, there's a new species of snow algae that we've been focused on um, that's in our site at Bagley that I mentioned. And that species just, we can't get any of the phases to grow in culture. So some of those, we need to work with field collected samples instead of cultured samples. Um, and we'd grow them typically on media that we make in the lab. So using water and then adding nutrients and things that we think that they need, but it's really difficult to simulate a snow environment. Allison, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, yeah, I agree. We actually, I'm, I'm, we recently just ordered a new incubator that's a low temperature incubator where we should be able to um, actually maintain snow sort of in at, not uh, we 
we sometimes have we have minus 20 freezers which is too cold but now we have this light and it's a it's a freezer or it's an incubator that has a light panel so i'm kind of hoping that we'll actually be able to do a new effort of um of trying to do some culturing um, because a lot of the there what robin said you know so much of the knowledge of of snow algae is it winds up being kind of anecdotal and, and there's a few species that are in culture there's a few species that are um in mixed culture because they're hard to also grow in pure culture um and so uh, by getting so, to understand their life history those life cycles that robin went through um we actually only know that for a few for a few uh, different taxa. So there's a, it, a lot of work to be done. And another interesting thing about that for people to know is that um, in Washington, a lot of the work that was done on snow algae and trying to culture them and understand their life cycle was done in the late 70s and early 80s. And then the same thing is actually true for the Sierras. And so yeah. using this DNA technology to study these communities is, is a fair, so the work that, that Allison and I are doing is a fairly new thing. Yeah, you know, I was going to add to what you said. In our about, regions. Yeah, I mean, I was going to add to the, the, um, to the question about the snow worms. I don't think we have the ice worms, but we did, I, when um, we did our first DNA analysis of communities up on the ridge behind Sugar Bowl, Mount Anderson Ridge there, I was um, kind of impressed by the different types of DNA that was sequenced when we just, we use these techniques where we're not only looking at the algal DNA, but all of the eukaryotic DNA. So there's a lot of fungi in there. Um, but there were also uh, nematodes, which are like little worms, and uh, spiders were in there. And so little tiny mites too. And so these things all are grazing on the algae and the bacteria that are in the snow. So it's, and, it's and an ephemeral ecosystem, right? Yeah, and snow rotifers too. I think we get a lot of those, yeah. which are these little tiny animals that eat algae in like lakes, but there's a snow adapted rotifer too that's eating the algae. That's incredible. So um, Russ had an interesting question about uh, whether the snow algae was not a good thing because it would accelerate snow melt in already accelerated melting glaciers. Um, but are they important to preserve? And are there any potential management practices that might come out of this research? That's a good yeah. question. <laughs> that is a really good question. A lot of people ask that. I mean, I think I can, I'll say what I, I'll, I'll say what I think, and then I'm, I'm interested to hear what Allison has to say too. I feel like moving to, to start with the management question, there's so many biology questions that we need to answer first, like we don't know how the bloom appear on the snow each year from year to year. So in order to, if you wanted to stop the bloom, you would actually need to know what to stop or which stage, which part of the life cycle you could intercept things. So there's still a lot of basic biology I feel like we need to do before we would get to a management place. And the good or bad, it's when you think about algae blooms, it's like these could be like harmful blooms on the snow surface if they, are, if the blooms are getting bigger and then that's increasing the rate of snow melt in a way that's really like negative to glaciers. However, they are the primary producers for these snow ecosystems. It is natural for them to occur. And if they if the snow algae weren't there, then there, we would be losing an entire snow microbiome ecosystem, which would also be a loss of biodiversity to the alpine system. So I think it's like a, it's hard to answer that question. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that there's, um, we don't know. I mean, there, there've been some kind of popular science articles that have come out in the, since we've been working together and, and Robin and I kind of compare notes on this and we're like, wow, there's, there's, um, a little bit of the sky is falling, uh, kind of, a approach in some of these popular science articles, but there's really not a lot of data behind it. So we don't, have this historical data that yet, you know, we're in the beginning stages of really collecting something where then we can understand how um, the abundance of the snow algae even varies in low snow versus high snow years and the really kind of regional um, to mountain, intermountain range extent of it. Uh, we're at the sort of beginning side of that data gathering. 
That's great. Um, uh, interesting question about uh, what kind of algae makes pink snow smell like watermelon? Or is it just a mental thing? You see it's pink, it's, you think, think of watermelon is, was my part of the question. You know, I have never smelled it smelling like watermelon. Although one of my graduate students that helped me start the Living Snow Project swore that she could smell it sometimes. What I think is happening is that at certain times in the life cycle, the algae may be producing some compound that, that's volatile, that has a smell and could smell like watermelon, but it's like not all the time. It has to be at the right, like the physiology has to be right for it to produce the thing that's smelly. But I've never smelled it. Have that's you interesting. It? That's our first quantitative difference between Sierra snow algae and the Cascades. Does uh, yours always smell? <laughs> not always, but yeah, it smells a lot. Oh. A, lot of the a lot of the time. That's really interesting. Oh, that is really I'd be interested to know how many people in the audience here know that. But um, I've I've really <laughs> I've really had that. Yeah. Kelly yeah. added on. I, I think I just thought great. it I don't know what the compound is, but I'm quite sure then that the algae makes this uh, basically the 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 things like that. It's the same chemical structure that is made in watermelon is probably made by these algae. But yeah, great question. I don't know the oh, exact that's that's so cool. It's that's like a really hard thing to study, but I would love to figure out. <laughs> Allison. Yeah, our that's natural really products cool. friends can help. <laughs> so um, I think you already answered this. Uh, Debbie Hunter asked, um, it was, the, was it was a saline solution. So maybe more specifics about the preservatives in the tubes. I think you already talked about this, but. Yeah, um, we call it RNA later, which might, is, I think that's actually like a trademark term. Um, for the kind of preservative that people use for preserving nucleic acids. Um, and so it's got a lot of salt is essentially. So sometimes when the tubes leak, um, there'll be like a little salt residue or if a tube happens to spill in your backpack, which has happened to me many times, you'll have a little salt on your backpack and you can just rinse it out in the sink. And it's, and it's as, as Robin said, it's not, uh... <laughs> not toxic, but it, it works for us um, in stabilizing the DNA in the cells um, because it renders all the enzymatic activity that would break down the DNA, it renders all those enzymes inactive. And so it just makes it, sell, it, it, it works uh, as a good preservative that way. Yeah, and we fill, we pre-fill the tubes, the collection tubes with like half the tube is already RNA later. So when you add snow, they're basically like 50-50 melted snow and RNA later in the tube after a collection. Great. Um, well, that is all of the questions and it's uh, just one o'clock. So thank you very much. This was incredibly interesting. I've seen the pink snow. I've not, not noticed the watermelon smell before, um, but now I know uh, that I need to go stop at Alpago and grab a sampling. <laughs> so can you tell us again, Megan, the um, locations? So it was Alpenglow in Tahoe City. Alpenglow in Tahoe City, Tahoe Mountain Sports in Truckee, and Patagonia, the Patagonia store in Reno. Okay. So Great. you can drop by, but please sign up first with the link that Heather just popped in the chat. Please sign up first um, so that we can, we can send you all of the information that you need to get started. Yeah. yeah. And, if you're, and if you're far away from a pickup spot, we can mail you a kit. So it's easy, it's much easier for us to have you pick it up, but we want you to participate even if you're far from one of those places. So we can mail them. And then I guess there is the other part too, is that if you don't have a kit, but you're out going for a hike and you can load up that app and sign up, load up the app, and then you can just make uh, observations so that we sort of know where you were seeing it. You can take photos and upload those with your observations too. So that's yeah. really helpful. There's a field for notes in the app once you've taken your major observation or taken a sample. So if it smells like pink, I mean, it smells like watermelon or oh, there's yeah. other anything else that you wanna share with us about what you see when you collect it, you can put all that information in the notes and we will see it. Great, and Megan, is there a link for the app as well or is that in the form once you fill out the form? So um, I'll, let me find it, I'll pop it in. All right. I believe it is in the Google. Drive. But if you search for Living Snow Project in the apps, Apple App Store or in Google Play Store, you'll find it. So it works on Android and Apple. Great. Thank you both. Thank you all so much. This was fantastic. And um, again, it will be recorded. 
there is a Zoom link. If anyone wants to reach out to me directly, I usually get the Zoom link within like an hour after the webinar ends. And then um, I can share that with your team and then um, with anyone who wants it. Um, it will take us a week or so, depending on staff time, to get it up on our UC Davis Turk or it's UC Davis Tahoe YouTube channel and on our website. So well, thank Shanae, you. Thanks for that awesome comment too. Yeah, okay. have a wonderful uh, rest of your day, everyone. And I'm gonna end the end the webinar now. Okay, thank you. Bye bye.